Welcome to part 4 of this mini-series about creating a sci-fi player chest in Houdini and make it an asset in your Unreal game. In this video we are taking a rough look at what was involved to allow the player to place the chest into the world, control all the material effects and finally be able to play the open and close animation. Now how does that all come together? When I started my Unreal learning journey, I found a lot of content when it comes to blueprints and very little when it comes to C++. And that makes sense. Visual scripting is a lot more accessible to a bigger crowd. But even though I enjoy how Unreal has implemented its visual scripting, I felt that I need to look at both angles. Meanwhile, I found an interesting breakdown of the whole C++ versus blueprints done by Alex Forsythe about the why you should use both. If I would try to summarize it, there are benefits to create the lower level, the foundation of your mechanics in C++, for example, how do weapons work in your game, and then have the higher level in blueprints, for example, what particle effects are spawned at the hit location. I strongly recommend taking a look at that video. That's what I wanted to do right from the start. I assume I still lack the experience to do it the right way, but I will keep learning and improving. But in case of my prototype, I started with a simple C++ actor class as the base type of object that the player will be able to place in the world. Objects that he can build. It is called a buildable. I found a great C++ tutorial to point me into the right direction. A wall building a la Fortnite. That link is in the description as well. This is where some components are already defined. So if you create a blueprint from this class, it will already have the components for different meshes inherited from the C++ class. Everything that you know you're going to need, like a bool variable if you want to use skeleton or the static mesh, or an event that you can call from the blueprint if a certain point is reached, all that can be defined in the C++ class. While the definition happens in the header files, the implementation is done in the CPP files. Here you have the basic logic how a certain object should behave. In the constructor, the components are initialized and get attached to the root component. Also, the fundamentals of the behavior can be implemented here. The player can enter a build mode, which lets him see the current selection of what he can build. In my case, the hologram of the crate. So if he places that with a mouse click, he needs to call the build function of this buildable. Then the function can handle tasks like setting the visibility of different meshes and fire events to help creating additional logic in Blueprint. The crate itself is not just a buildable, it's a lootable build, something that the player should be able to interact with and that has an inventory. This is another C++ class that is inherited from the buildable class. In simple words, that means the crate has everything what a normal buildable has, the preview and the build mesh, but it also has another mesh for its final form. Animation assets that can be played when interacted with, a loot table for its potential items and components to handle inventory and interaction. I slowly move over to craft my own logic on the C++ side, but I had a great starting point with the C++ survival course from Ruben Ward. By the way, the hologram material is not specific to the crate. You can apply this to any mesh. Again, a great tutorial by Unreal CG. This setup gives you the freedom of using different meshes for the same object while at the same time allowing you to keep it somewhat simple. Here the skeleton build mesh is the same as the final loot container mesh. One aspect that we have not seen yet is how to create and export the animation assets from Houdini to Unreal. There are a few tricky steps when it comes to animation assets. They were defined in the C++ class, so you find these in the details of the blueprint, since it is a child from that. But before we make the jump back to Houdini, we should take a look at the blueprint side of the build transition. Whenever you have a material that should change its behavior during runtime, Unreal uses a dynamic material instance. This would also be possible in C++, but it feels a bit more practical on this side. But nevertheless, you need to create a dynamic material instance for the mesh in question. And you also need to set the parameter you want to influence. I do that here in the construction script. 
to create a variable for the dynamic material. You can see here that the source material is pointing to the material instance with the dissolve effect on it. When you create the dynamic material, it also expects an element index. So if you would have created a material with multiple material slots, you would need to specify which one you want to override. So if we wouldn't have used the UDIM workflow, we would have needed to create five of these dynamic instances. But this way, one is enough. I'm going to update this material during runtime once an object is placed. So I'm going to need a reference to this material. I'm also going to need access to the variable that is setting the dissolve amount. I want this effect to be visible for each player. So the variable is set to replicated, also identifiable through the icon of two spheres in the corner here. But let's take a look at the blueprint coding and how the transition is started, updated and finished. First on begin play, I'm going to bind a custom event on the on start build event that is coming from the C++ class. That was triggered when the build function on the buildable object is called. It's this on start build broadcast which is doing it. That happens once the player is pressing the left button when in build mode, while a buildable is selected. Basically the one which the player can see as a hologram. This event then is calling another event that are defined here in the blueprint, the server start build event, which runs on the server. The idea is that only the server is allowed to do critical actions like spawning objects. When the object is placed, the server starts the building process, which in this example consists of changing the dissolve effect from fully dissolved to fully visible. To have a smooth transition, we need to update that parameter in small increments. The tick could be used for that, but using the tick can be expensive for performance. And I wanted to make a habit to use that as little as possible. So another option is to use a timer. A timer that activates in very short intervals, over and over, until it's cleared. It's a timer by event, so each time it activates, it calls that event. I have named it start build, but it should have been named something like building because it not only starts the building process, it also updates the build animation during the transition. It is calling the function build animation, which provides the current value of the dissolve amount. After that animation, I also experimented with some quick and dirty sound effects for the process. With a do once, I can trigger them at the actor's location. Besides the indicator that something is placed, there's also one continuous sound that keeps looping while the transition takes place. That needs to be saved in a variable so that we can terminate it once the build is finished. The build function consists of two sequences. The first one is basically doing the same as the construct script. It sets the material parameter to the current value of dissolve. The second sequence is reducing the value by a tiny fraction. Remember the mesh is fully dissolved with a high value and gets revealed if the value is reduced. Then the remaining value is tested in a branch if the current value is less or equals a threshold. That threshold is the value when the crate is fully visible. Of course the decrement step and the end threshold should be defined as variables on the blueprint. Each object might have different values for an optimal result. For example, a taller structure would need to do a quicker transition to finish in the same time as the crate does. But maybe you want a slower timing for more important structures, even if they are small. Anyway, whenever the threshold is reached, the branch returns into the true section, which will clear out the timer. Then after making sure this is done by the server, I call an event called build finished to do the cleanup. That cleanup happens in the function build completion. Like the initial sound experience, I just threw in some sound related steps right here in the event graph. And that is stopping the looping sound and playing a final sound file. Let's take a look at the build completion function. This initial section here took some nerve. In my first attempt, I had issues setting up the inheritance between a buildable object and a lootable object that I showed before. So I just created another class which had everything combined. But that makes parts of it redundant. As I said, not every object is interactable or has an inventory. 
So this time I figured out my initial issues. I knew this would be the better approach. But something slipped my mind when I first tried this. When the player is looking at the preview, its position changes according to where he looks and stands. Currently that's in the tick component. That's only the preview. Once he decides to place the crate, the building component of the player is calling a build function. That function call is done by the server. To make sure that the server is doing it, we grab the owner of the building component and check if he has authority, meaning the server is actually the one that's doing it. If not, the server build function is called and this function call ends. The server then calls the build function itself. Now this condition will be true. Location and rotation again gets grabbed the same way the preview mesh was spawned. Then a new buildable is spawned and its build function gets called. If you remember, that sets the visibility for the build operation. Now, why does that matter in the blueprint? At this moment, the crate has an invisible preview mesh and a visible build mesh, fully revealed at the very location that was defined through the C++ class. But that only counts for the components belonging to the buildable class. The final form of the object, the loot container mesh, is part of the more specialized class and it has no idea of that location. I was thrown off by the fact that in my test that crate seemed to appear in the middle of the map instead of the position where it was built. But in hindsight it makes sense. It doesn't know where to place it, so it just spawns it at the world center. To counter that I need to get the actor location before I set the loot container to visible. Instead of doing it in Blueprint, I could also save the buildable location in an attribute that the lootable build can access and then update its position there. But the result is the same. Now the loot container will appear in the correct position since it grabs the position of the actual actor and gives that over to the mesh. Now it can be turned visible while the build meshes are set to invisible. We are closing in on the animations now. Obviously the animations need to be triggered somehow. And I'm doing that again by an event that is called from the C++ side. From the mentioned survival course, I have an interaction system in place that is controlled by an interaction component, which was inherited by the lootable build class. The C++ class behind this defined a number of attributes that belong to this component. It allows me to add the component to all kinds of different assets and then define what the interaction should be. Here the name text is chest and the action is called open. As with the build process, there's a moment of action in this component that triggers an event. Once the player is interacting with an interactable object, it broadcasts an event called on interact. This makes it available in the blueprint where I can utilize it. As you have seen before, I already did that. It calls another custom event that I built here in the event graph. Doing it here makes replication a bit easier to see since that event is called multiplay animation. Multi because it's meant to do a multiplayer capable thing. When this is called, it executes on all clients. Again, I threw in some experimental sound effects, but the main task is checking the status of the box. Is it open or not? That variable is again replicated and depending of its status, it either plays the closing or the opening animation. Let's take one more look at the result of the build transition and the animation triggered by the interaction event. 